Doc Benz, from Shrapnel Magazine number 3, written by David Smith, read by Shrapnel. Fortress class dropship, FSS Artemis, planetary orbit, Nouveau Toulouse, Federated Suns, 9 November 2790, T-7 seven hours, 32 minutes to planetary barrage. Admiral Meris was about to enjoy his coffee when the main viewer suggested only despair. The upper orbit of Nouveau Toulouse 4 was littered with combined dropships. Vector lines and targets sorted the enemy fleet, lighting up the main bridge screen like a complex circuit. How many? Captain Howard asked. An ensign scanned cycling data. 238 dropships, 240,762 fighters and bombers, 214 are bombers. Meris set his coffee down. He'd lost. A jump ship ferrying six more dropships for the Federated Suns jolted into position at its selected pirate point, adding to his fleet of 38. But they would never make it in time. Meris's dropship led the puny fleet into position above the planet. He didn't bother to deploy fighters. We need to bug out. Head back to our jump ships. Just get the hell out. Howard was dressed neatly in command blues, scrubbed, ironed and attentive. Meris stared at the impossible odds on the viewer. That's what they want, he thought. A sane commander would simply retreat. Instead, he breathed in. Keep our position. Meris looked wary, with a bushy salt and pepper moustache. He brushed it with his hand as he thought. If we stay, we are as good as dead. I have contingency orders. Meris said it like a death sentence. Howard looked the man over soberly. His mouth moved, but not what he wanted it to say. All dropships, form up in echelon formation. Repeat, all dropships, fighter escorts deploy. Await further orders. Aye, sir. The bridge was absolutely quiet, except for fingers tapping on keyboards. What's happening on the surface? Meris kept himself calm. A new light. A comm officer repositioned her monitor and scrolled through tabs. Zooming into ground video. Smoke and laser fire filled the screen. The video was mute and mostly pixelated. Intense fighting, sir. About three battalions of combined forces are moving in. We have less than one battalion at new light. Another comm officer piped in. All six factory cities are under heavy fire. Our forces are outnumbered two to one. More combine dropships are reinforcing five to one. How about Doc Benz? Meris asked. Is he still alive? Searching, sir. There was a long pause. Searching. We're being hailed, sir. Channel 81, Command Priority Alpha 1, Colonel Paul Benz. Meris grimaced. Don't respond. The radio popped and squealed. Federated Suns Relief Fleet, respond. Static blared and echoed. Federated Suns Relief Fleet, respond, goddammit. Don't. Howard watched the data cycle. The Drac Fleet is holding position. They're waiting for us to retreat, Maris said. Deafening feedback screeched at them. The comm officer softened it. Federated Suns Relief Fleet, respond. Static. Federated Suns Relief Fleet, respond. Meris put a hand to his forehead and sighed. Who's up there? Rimey? Meris? If it's you, Meris, you owe me. Respond. It's you. Isn't it, Meris? It's got to be. Respond. Put me through, Meris said. He waited for the connection. This is Meris. About bloody time, I'm sending drop coordinates. Doc's voice was raspy from yelling and screaming. We were having comm trouble. Don't give me that line, Meris. Just drop those mechs at my coordinates. We've got this. Well, we're awaiting confirmation from command. We've lost, Colonel. What? What? Where's Rimey? Is he up there? Give me Rimey. It's just me, Paul. We've lost. Drop at my coordinates. We still have a chance. For years, 
Paul Benz had been fortifying the bottlenecks at every factory city to stand against overwhelming forces. He just needed to exhaust the Kurita forces to a costly withdrawal. What Doc hadn't planned for was the immensity of the fleet in orbit that could hammer him with waves of reinforcements after easily dispatching the smaller Fed Sun's fleet. What the Combine hadn't counted on was the inhuman tenacity of Doc Benz. An explosion and loud static cut in. You'll be a hero, Maris. Doc Benz continued. You know that's what you want. We just need to hold new light. Distracted, he yelled. Focus fire on that archer. You got him. Fire. Take him. Hell yeah. A few seconds later, he said. Look, Admiral, they won't even remember me, but you, the saviour of Nouveau, Toulouse, bucking orders in a desperate gamble with a brilliant ground strategy that was too costly for the Combine. I've been planning this for years. I know how we are going to win this. A sharp bang and static stung the ears of the bridge crew, then... Son of a... Another loud explosion. Paul regained the comm. I can't lose. That's why you put me here. Now drop. Doc Benz is right, Maris thought. He was a tactical genius and a charismatic leader. He led the 8th Avalon Hussars 2nd Battalion before serving as Professor of Military Strategy at Albion Military Academy. He then switched to Sakara Academy because he was too... abrasive. He preferred Sakara for its emphasis on duty and personal honour, and his second wife Cassandra preferred the people. He held a doctorate in military history, hence the nickname. He had enough field decorations to lead any kind of mech combat training. Doc thrived and shook the chain of command. He had opinions. He had served tirelessly until Cassie's unexpected death. Mourning had stoked his political irritations into flippant political criticism, which resulted in his political assassination by powerful cowards. Doc Benz was an anomaly, too talented to set to pasture but too charismatic to keep visible. He was practically a cult leader. Meris himself had offered Nouveau to lose to Paul. He would lead a regional training battalion away from the rhetoric on a semi-quiet world known for its manufacturing and essential due to its proximity to combined space. He was so successful that his single battalion grew to three, enabling the original veteran defense force, the second Avalon Hussars, to be redeployed to other conflicts. Eventually, these three regional training battalions were renamed Doc's Scorpions. No doubt Benz has likely rallied the whole defense force into a perfect, obedient machine, Meris thought. Paul Benz earned respect by tirelessly devoting himself to his soldiers and usually putting himself in the greatest danger first. The opposite of a typical military politician he inspired his men to their deaths in a real, thankful dignity. That was why Command feared him. That's why he was stationed at Nouveau Toulouse 4. He was too good for his own good, because he was envied. Meris had served under him at New Avalon. Doc Benz was like a father. Hell, Benz treated him better than his real father. If anyone could achieve victory against incredible odds, it was Doc Benz. But like a father, Paul's opinionated shouting caused political embarrassment for Meris, which almost cost him his career. Meris had brooded about it over the years. Paul was right about his former accusations, truthful but too idealistic. But Meris wasn't ready to throw his life away. The odds were too great. He lacked the patriotism, the will. He had a family on New Avalon, a life. Meris kept silent. You're not going to give in to that psycho, are you? Howard blurted. No, no, of course not. Meris straightened his jacket. Paul, we are still waiting on command for the final word. You know what to do. Drop at my coordinates. A final crackle and sputter ended the conversation. Howard watched Meris pace a bit. What now, sir? We wait for our final orders. New Light City, Nouveau Toulouse, Federated Suns, 9 November 2790. T-minus 7 hours, 2 minutes to planetary barrage. Dog's head shook in his neuro-helmet. 
from a nearby blast that rocked his mech, an awesome 8Q. Sweat ran down the lines on his face and around a thin white goatee. His helmet was newer and painted with a laughing mouth with cobra fangs. His body was athletic for his age, shaved, dressed in biker shorts and combat boots. A wide, faded tattoo of a soaring crow flexed on his chest with each jerk of his control sticks. Under the wings, the tattoo read, Live to die, scorpions. He preferred the upstart crow image, but scorpions were more typical of the desert region of this planet, and more deadly. Doc's massive awesome raised its arm-mounted particle projection cannon to fire a crackling lightning blast at a jumping griffin. The forest green mech was hit dead in the torso, shedding armor and internal chunks in a blast of smoke and electricity. As the griffin touched down, the weight of the collapsing torso tore through its pelvis and it hit the ground in a roaring black cloud. Doc's awesome and his command lance ran past the downed mech. Beside Doc ran his lieutenant, Rick Adams, in an atlas. Running for an assault mech was not that fast, but it kept moving and raining fire on enemies ahead. Rick kept to himself outside of battles, and before today, that was years of practical solitude. He talked to Doc all the time though, for orders and direction. Doc liked Rick. Rick was dedicated, focused and dependable. Rick was curt around others, and everyone called him Richard behind his back because he hated it. Everyone, except Doc's command lance. They appreciated him for what he was, a professional killer, none his equal except the Doc. Ahead of Rick ran Alex Kunz in his lighter Archer 2R. Alex fired three medium lasers at a sprinting wasp. Two shots missed their intended target of the chest, but instead cleaved the head straight off, throwing the wasp's body to the ground in a heap. The final mech warrior, Rob Trent, trampled the lifeless wasp in his charging warhammer. The heavy mech slipped on the robotic corpse, but recovered after a slight misstep and a loud crunch. Like the rest of his lance, Rob's mech was painted in sun-bleached khaki with wavy strips of dark red. A black scorpion, outlined in white, rested on a thick red chevron on the mech's lower leg, the emblem from Doc Scorpions. Doc's command lance continued down a corridor of burning industrial buildings in the planet's capital, New Light. Remaining civilians were mostly packed into APCs and troop transports, waiting anxiously in armoured parking garages, ready to evacuate. Doc and his troops needed to thin the attack force, or the transports would be sitting ducks for the Combine. Doc was keeping the Draconis forces busy until his reinforcements would arrive, and it was working. Doc's scorpions had been drilling for this anticipated conflict since Kerensky's exodus. Nouveau Toulouse was valuable and vulnerable. Valuable for its six specialized mech and weapons factories. Vulnerable for its remote location near the Kurita border. The last four years of planning and training had consumed Paul Benz. In fact, he had expected this invasion last year. He was surprised it had taken the Combine so long to attack this low-hanging fruit. But so far, so good, he thought. The battle was going as predicted, with just a few more casualties than expected. Doc just needed those reinforcements. His three battalions were dispersed across the city. One under his command, and the other two optimally split between the other five city factories. New Light would see the heaviest fighting. That's why he led the battle. Other Albion instructors would reluctantly confess that Doc was practically an assault lance unto himself. Almost instinctually, Rick targeted a distant longbow, firing a salvo of long-range missiles. In sync with Rick, Doc fired two of his PBCs. Rob and Alex added their own fire as well. The longbow was pelted with missile and energy blasts while targeting another Bedson's lance with its own alpha strike. The Combine mech staggered in plumes of flame, limping behind a hill before one of its missile pods tore loose. Great work, men. Doc kept his eyes ahead of him, approaching another enemy lance. A squawk of the radio sounded. Chick Matson spoke over garbled static. Doc, we're on Luminous Factory 2. They're targeting our dropship. They're gonna take it. I'm down to two companies. I need more mechs. 
Paul didn't take his eyes off his targeting reticules, his command lance was blasting an enemy medium lance. Two Combine Shadowhawks were targeting New Light's Union-class dropship Amanda 4, mostly its defense weapons. This alerted Paul. Why would they destroy our dropships? They're too costly to destroy intentionally, and a much better captured asset. A diversion? Okay, Madison. I'll send Javits company. I need two at least. Christy, what are their numbers? Christy sprinted her locust around the perimeter of New Light with her recon lance. Her mech's titanium chicken legs sped through a hillside, kicking up turf and rock in her wake. Twenty inside. She meant enemy mechs in the city. And only a support lance outside with a frack longbow. Nothing else currently. Three Overlord dropships inbound, but we have a good twenty minutes before they deploy. Thanks, Christy. Keep it up. Christy snorted. Hey, don't we have reinforcements coming? Where are they? I'm on it. I need more than Javi. Chick whined. All right. Javi and Emerald Companies. Join up with Matson and Factory 2. Sure, Doc. Javi didn't want to leave the Doc short-handed. We got this, Doc. Rick piped in. Rick had never called Paul Doc. He was always stiff and formal, respectful. Was Rick loosening up in his enthusiasm, or had he let it slip due to fear? Was it the fear of inevitable death that brushed aside formality? The Scorpions had held so far, but without Fedson's reinforcements, they would be overrun soon. Even with the reinforcements, they would still be terribly outgunned. Instinct took over his thought process. Hell yeah, we got this. Live to die, Scorpions. The comm erupted from his pilots. Live to die, hell yeah. All except Matson. Ren Company, remain at Nav 3. Enemy mechs inbound. Both Javi and Emmy affirmed their orders and their respective mech companies sprinted toward Factory 2. Combine lances broke through a building perimeter and rushed towards Wren Company. A chaos of ordnance fired between mechs. Concrete and asphalt blew like confetti until black smoke concealed it. Paul hit his comm. Maris, relief fleet, over. An ensign replied. We have you, Colonel. Maris, have you heard from command? FSS Artemis. Meris was hunched over a terminal. No word yet? Just send them, Meris. We don't have any time left. Chick is under heavy fire. We're losing assets. We can't win this, Paul. We're outgunned. Six to one. The Drax have us. We're done. Meris winced, thinking he likely sounded more like a recruit than an admiral. They aren't firing on us. They're waiting. If we act, we're dead. We can do this. It'll be costly for them. They don't have the stomach for it. It's six to one now. I can win this. Did you look at my drop points? My numbers? They're bold, Paul. Risky. But we can do it. I'm... I'm still waiting on command. Maris glared at his comm officer to disconnect. New Light City. Paul's awesome crunched through a smouldering manticore tank and paced around a corner with his command lance, cursing under his breath. His targeting screen lit up, an enemy lance was closing. Paul pushed through a plume of smoke. Got a visual? Alex had it. Assault mech. Sucks. Four of them. The four 80-ton mechs smashed through broken buildings, raining glass, ferrocrete chunks and twisted frames of metal. Each one was delicately illustrated with crimson and gold dragons on jade panelling. One thug had obsidian panelling with a shimmering jade helmet and gloves. They seemed too costly to risk in a battle, too immaculate and priceless. Oh, royalty, Doc said. Focus fire, boys. Crush their command. Alex fired a volley of 40 long-range missiles at the lance. Smoke blew from his archer's exhaust ports as Doc's lance exchanged PPC fire with the charging thugs. The missiles pounded one of the thugs, nearly toppling it, but it corrected its gait and continued. Doc's awesome took a couple of hits to its torso, which resembled a giant apartment building more than a robotic chest. The blast pushed the mech back a step, with sparks and armor fragments spitting from the wound. Doc fired all three of his PPCs, all connecting on the center enemy mech. Alex, Rick, and Rob 
defied everything at the rushing lands in one glorious alpha strike as they paced through broken buildings. A storm of missiles and lasers lit the sky in fire and light, slamming the enemy mechs. The centre jade thug ignited in flame and crumpled into molten slag. The pilot ejected from the shattered mech helmet in a spear of flame. The return salvo of PPC fire blew the right arm off Rob's warhammer. His right torso was also ravaged, but his armour absorbed it. The warhammer lost its balance and smashed into an adjacent building, crushing it like a paper bag. The interior structure caught Rob's mech enough for him to regain his footing and spin around to return fire. What was left of his armour panelling simply dropped off when he fired a volley of short-range missiles. Only a couple of missiles connected, but it covered him enough to keep moving. A second combine thug took heavy PPC fire from the dock. Its right arm was blasted off and a direct hit to the torso would have caused an internal explosion if it hadn't had case. The enormous arm slammed to the ground, crushing a nearby hatchback like aluminium. Paul aimed and fired a double shot again, not too concerned about the rising heat his mech was generating. Dalk's men and the Combine command mechs ducked and weaved through buildings, circling and taking shots of opportunity. Rick's Atlas fired everything at a wounded Jade thug, but it was the blast of his heavy defiant mech hunter autocannon that punched it through a building, finishing it off with a ridiculous cartoon-like hole through its chest. An ejection seat shot out, but it collided with a floor of broken building, ricocheted and thudded onto concrete. Keep firing, we have them. Paul was aiming and firing through debris and bent light poles. Rob, get up. He knew Rob was up. It was more of a poorly timed joke than a command. Paul nearly skidded on debris of a flattened building as he was lining up a shot, but he kept his pace. The Combine pilots were agile for assault mechs, but not experienced. Perhaps they were sons of dukes or counts, allowed to play war and gain experience at killing in a controlled game. Perhaps pride kept them from waiting until they had two more battalions in front of them to soften their targets. The possibility of this bravery gave Paul a bit of respect for them, but they were no match for his veteran lance, and he would show them no mercy. The remaining two thugs ducked behind ruined buildings. Alex was cooling down his weapons while manoeuvring for a better shot. His targeting system showed the Combine mech gaining distance. They're falling back. Ren, you have two assault mechs incoming. Give them hell, Paul said. Those enemy dropships are landing. Christie's voice cut in. Battalions incoming. I don't see our forces in the sky yet. Tell me something good, Doc. Keep running, Christy. Ren, get dug in. We can't count on Meris. He's not going to drop. He's a coward. He's willing to give his planet to the Drax, but we're not going to give it to them. Oh, we will protect Amanda Four and get as many civilians and mech warriors on board to escape. Yes, sir. You can count on us, Doc. Christy? Observe the enemy's routes into the city and fall back to my position when they get within two clicks. Your squad will be the first to board the dropships. We can back you up, Doc, with hit and run attacks. You will be the first. We will cover you. Okay. Christy said with disappointment. Christy was in her 30s, experienced and dedicated. She often shared Doc's stubborn resolve to do what was right. She was old enough to be his daughter, if he had one. He was proud of her but her heroic self-sacrificing talk was starting to piss him off. T minus five hours, 37 minutes to planetary barrage. Engaging assault mechs. Ren cut in. Ren's command lance consisted of two griffins, one wolverine and one shadow hawk. All were medium mechs with jump capability and waiting on top of three buildings in sniper positions. Both enemy thugs, Jade and Obsidian entered long range and fired their PPCs at the snipers. Two shots hit the building and two connected with the Shadow Hawk, nearly shoving it off the roof in an explosion of blinding light. Focus fire, the left one. Both Griffins fired their PPCs along with autocannon and missile shots from the others. The Jade thug slowed and shed burning armor. The Obsidian thug maneuvered in front of the damaged mech to shield it. See that? firing on the damaged one. Ren kept firing. His lance was taking devastating hits from short-range missile and PPC fire. The buildings were shaking around him, 
and the Shadow Hawks building collapsed in smoke and debris. Wolverine was lost in a plume of dust and ash. Ren called out to the Shadow Hawk. There was no reply. He ordered the others. Both Combine mechs smashed into Ren's building, still firing missiles and PPCs at his lance. The damaged Jade Thug was caught in the collapsing building, weakened by missile and laser fire. The Combine pilot ejected in a bright plume of rocket thrust. Ren and his fellow Griffin hit their jump jets when their building disintegrated underneath them. Both landed slowly near the remaining Obsidian mech. It punched off the second Griffin's leg at the knee with a calculated hit. The Griffin stumbled and smashed into asphalt, but Ren fired his rifle-shaped PPC at the thug, causing it to evade to cover. Ren's Wolverine pilot, Eddie, emerged on foot from a collapsed building, running and coughing. Sorry, Commander. He radioed. Maybe we can dig you out. Ren said. He watched his fellow Griffin steady itself into a kneeling position, ready to fight. Not a chance. Get ready for another attack. Ren was watching the blip that was the remaining obsidian thug. It was blinking away from their position. Dozens of new blips lit the circumference of his tack display. Enemy reinforcement. The thug blip faded and ceased. They ran away. Ren said in disbelief, just as a volley of missiles rained down on them, igniting the whole street in pounding explosions. Paul's voice reverberated. Fall back to my position, Nav 1. Two battalions of Drax are on us. I'm falling back to you. Christy sounded shrill and panicked. The third Drax dropship reinforced at Factory 2, but six more are inbound. Ren and Christy, get over here. Civilians are already boarding. We'll cover them and get the hell out of here. Christy will board first. They've got air support. Christy reported. Just get back here. Ren took to his comm. Ren Company, fall back to Amanda 4. His other two lances emerged through dust and flame, having dispatched a Curita recon lance. T minus three hours, 16 minutes to planetary barrage. Doc had just positioned his command lance around the giant spheroid dropship Amanda 4 when enemy missiles pelted them. A line of APCs and transports entering the dropship were hit, throwing a supply truck like a toy, smashing it into another truck on its flank. Focus on those longbows on that ridge at two o'clock, Paul ordered. Rick fired a salvo of 20 long-range missiles from his Atlas, combined with Alex's double volley from his Archer. The missiles joined the hazy sky of explosions and tracer rounds. We're falling back to you, Paul. It sounded like Chick. Who? Is that Chick? Yes, we're falling back to your position. Negative, Matson. Secure your dropship. We're getting out of here. We're evacuating. It's gone, Paul. It's wrecked. We're falling back. What the hell are you talking about? Get Javi and Emmy on the comp. They're gone. Everything is fracked. Paul aimed and sniped at approaching Combine mechs. Missiles exploded on his awesome, but he shrugged it off. Christie's recon lance arrived and ran circles around the convoy dodging enemy fire and taking opportunity shots at her approaching mechs. Paul couldn't even greet her, he was too busy with a chick. Where's Javi and Emmy? They're dead, Paul. Half my unit is wiped. You got them killed? Paul's mouth spit when he said it. We're approaching your position. FSS Artemis, T minus one hour, 17 minutes to planetary barrage. In low orbit, Meris entered the bridge and stepped towards Howard. A huge centered tactical display showed the position of the 200 plus enemy dropships and their own 38. Meris's fleet was not surrounded, but instead faced an enormous wedge of enemy dropships. Six additional friendly dropships from the planet had positioned themselves behind Meris's force. These carried civilians and equipment, typically for mech redeployment, and had launched before the invasion Enemy fighter wings flew between them, but did not attack yet. You received word? Howard asked. Are we getting the hell out of here? Yes. Meris was somber. We are ordered to bomb the factories to keep them from combine hands. Then, we're getting the hell out of here. So, Doc, we're leaving him and the civilians? He has a couple of dropships. They can evacuate. One, sir. 
chick lost his. Meris's face turned white. He exhaled. They'll have to make do. Paul knows what to do. Howard and Meris held eye contact. Considering their course of action, their crime. Meris broke the silence. Ready, AMW warheads. Target all six factories. Prepare for evasive maneuvers the instant we launch. We'll make a break for the jump ships. Come, hail our jump ships. New Light City. T minus 41 minutes to planetary barrage. Paul's lance was pounded by missile and autocannon fire, but they stood their ground at Amanda 4, which was unloading its own massive amount of defensive fire to help cover the defending mechs. Rick's Atlas had lost most of its armor in its torso, exposing internal components in Myama. He fired his ordnance carelessly in an attempt to deny the enemy a gratuitous ammo explosion. The assault mech had also taken a direct hit to its right hip actuator, so Rick was circling even slower than normal around craters and broken up roads. Alex's archer had taken some heavy armor damage and his left arm was gone. Rob's warhammer had taken considerable damage as well, with both arm cannons lost and most of his torso armor stripped clean. He had dumped his machine gun ammo to avoid a critical explosion and kept fighting, still able to fight at close range. Ren still had his griffin with minimal damage and his fellow griffin kept to a kneeling rifle position. Christie's recon lance was mostly unharmed. She had taken some damage to the centre torso of her locust, but her accompanying locust and two wasps had only armour damage and were weaving in and out of the city ruins around the dropship. Paul counted 10 green blips for his mechs, but 30 plus enemies closing in. Four other enemy dropships were unloading their units outside of the city, unopposed. It was only a matter of time now. Perhaps Chick could provide some much needed relief. What remained of his 3rd Battalion was falling back via APCs, losing mechs to protect civilians and ground personnel. They were supposed to rendezvous with Amanda 5, Chick's dropship, but it was gone now. Perhaps they could make it to Amanda 4. They had done their part. They were isolated at factories 5 and 6 and their losses were expected. Amanda 4 is taking damage. Christy reported. You're next, Christy, Paul said. Board your lance. He'd lost over half of his civilian evacuees so far. The Combine forces were too aggressive and held little value for non-combatants. Despite fighting and coordinating the battle, Paul's conscience found a moment to blame him for the deaths. We're out of time. We need to evacuate. Chick will have civilians with him. Shouldn't they have priority? Christy was right. Paul hated to admit it. He didn't want to lose anyone else. He had lost too many of his own troops already, and it was his duty to protect the people, and his fighters knew it. Christy knew it. Okay, Christy. You're right. Let's cover them when they arrive. We have to keep the enemy off their backs. We don't have room for mechs but we'll squeeze in as many APCs and people as we can. We have to do better. There will only be room for those civilians, Paul thought. His team would perish defending them. He hated the thought, it angered him. Not all of the civilians would survive to get on board either. There would be a pinch of room though. He would order Christy to board. She could make it. The thought energized him, gave him a little hope. He fought fiercer. The enemy was on them, showering them in death. He could barely think as his mech throttled and burned. Live to die! She said. Everyone else yelled, Hell yeah! Scorpion! Even Paul whispered it. They were surrounded, taking fire, limbs tearing. Rick's Atlas kneeled, critically damaged but still fired steadily. Rob's warhammer exploded into molten chunks. He ejected into a hail of fire. Even Paul's awesome was hemorrhaging armor and black smoke. He kept fighting, his heat levels maxing almost at shutdown. Paul read his tack displays. A full regiment of enemy mechs surrounded him now. Something from orbit? Paul double-checked. A barrage of smart missiles? 
They were AMWs, Asset Management Weapons, enough to glass the entire continent. Why would the Combine? No, it was Meris. Oh God! Christy said it first. Get on the dropship, Christy, your lancers first. Amanda 4, launch, launch. There's room for you, Doc. Amanda 4's pilot said. I said launch. I got them, Doc. Get on with Christy. It was Rick. Again, he called him Doc. Is this the end? Launch, keep firing. Was all Paul could say. T minus eight minutes to planetary barrage. We're here. Chick interrupted. Cut a hole, Harmon. Storm the dropship. Chick scorpions smashed their way from behind a lance of combine mechs, rushing the dropship. Chick piloted a battered marauder, trailing smoke and sparks. Enemy mechs targeted them, sparing Paul's group a moment. Get your civilians on, Paul said. We'll cover you. They're gone, Chick replied. We couldn't save them. Where's 3rd Battalion's APCs? They were wiped, covering us. No, they weren't. Paul was dumbfounded. He couldn't believe it. They're gone. We're taking the dropship. We have wounded. You monster! How dare you! Paul aimed his PPCs at Chick. Christy, get your lance on board, there's no time. Paul's tack screen tracked the orbital barrage less than seven minutes to impact. Amanda 4 lit ten stabilizing thrusters. Smoke and debris flushed from the enormous sphere. Despite heavy enemy fire, Christy's recon lance sprinted to the dropship. Christy was last in line, of course, assuring her troops made it on first. Chick's lance opened fire on Christy's. Christy stopped, surprised, and returned fire at Chick. Doc stepped up next to her, also firing back. You are dead, chick. Dead. Get on, Christy. Christy's battered locust turned to face the ramp when a giant metal slab smashed down near her cockpit, missing it and smashing her right hip to pieces. It was the arm of the obsidian thug. A locust collided with the boarding ramp. Christy slid out through her mech's access hatch and ran for her life, slipping on sweat and blood. Alex fired lasers at Chick's marauder, running towards the ramp Christy was scrambling up. Rob rammed the thug with his weakened warhammer. The obsidian mech fired both short-range missile groups at the warhammer, directly into its chest, causing it to explode. Rob's auto-ejection system shot him up into a sky full of tracer rounds and laser fire. Doc faced the combine thug. It was burning and smoking at the joints, wounded from battle. There was a delicately inscribed kanji on its forehead. This must be an elite, he thought. A royal trainer? Are the jade thugs piloted by his pupils? The obsidian mech charged. Doc's awesome grappled it, battering it with its left arm and PPC barrel, pushing the smoking mech away. Doc gained some distance as they circled, exchanging bright blasts of PPC fire. Rick shot his heavy autocannon and remaining medium lasers at the enemy mech, shredding the thug's left arm and torso in the attack. Crazed, the obsidian thug charged Paul again. Combined fire from two enemy lances hit Rick's atlas. It burst apart and exploded in fire. Thank you, sir. Was all he could say at the end. The auto-ejection system shot him into the sky, but there was so much enemy fire. Amid the chaos, Paul realized Rick was dead and he was being charged. He fired everything, an alpha strike. Alex's archer joined him with a burst of missile and laser fire. The upper left half of the thug exploded into bits, but the enemy mech kept running, or rather stumbling into Paul, arms raised, short range missiles firing. The thug took Paul's PPC arm in one brutal yank. The obsidian mech exploded in blinding light, ejection seats spiraling into the red sky. Paul's awesome crashed to the ground. Ren had shot the thug in the back, finishing it off. But more shots from enemy mechs surrounding them hit Ren. His mech staggered and exploded into flames. Paul wrenched his awesome back into a standing position while taking laser hits from nearby enemy mechs circling. He saw Chick's lance mates boarding Amanda 4. Chick was distracted in hand-to-hand -hand combat with two enemy wolverines. Otherwise, he would have been the first one on the dropship. Paul's awesome paced towards Chick. 
taking more hits from combined mechs, but not dissuaded. Alex's limping mech joined him, firing what he had left at Chick until his archer succumbed to enemy fire and he ejected. Four minutes, 13 seconds to impact. The dropship bay doors were closing as thrusters roared for liftoff. Chick's marauder broke away from the entangled mechs and leaped towards the shuttered doors. Paul charged the marauder, colliding and pushing it off the ramp. Both mechs crashed into city rubble. Its doors finally sealed, Amanda Force slowly lifted off. A final burst of fire from the rising dropship kept many combine mechs pinned. Three minutes, 31 seconds to impact. Paul burned and screamed, ah! lifting his awesome from broken ground. Chick's marauder kicked to flop itself over. Whoever stood first to fire... Three minutes, four seconds to impact. Christy frantically strapped herself into an emergency seat, chest heaving. Too panicked to grieve, she was angry. Gasping, she yelled in frustration. She had survived. Two minutes, 14 seconds to impact. Chick's marauder stood, barely. Aimed recklessly to fire first, a double PPC strike hitting Paul's awesome in the right leg, toppling him. Paul fired in mid-fall. His PPC shots seemed so slow in that moment, electric blue tangles rippling in intensity until it struck the marauder in the cockpit, blasting it to metallic splinters and crackling sparks. 96 seconds to impact. Christy clenched her teeth as the G-forces increased. The loading bay shook and rumbled. Tex and support crew had also strapped into launch seats. They all focused on the unbearable pressure. Someone caught her eye, a mech warrior. It was Rob. He survived. He didn't see her. She would have laughed, but she could barely breathe. 67 seconds to impact. Paul's smouldering awesome lay on its back, and he watched the Amanda 4 approach orbit by a fizzling tack screen. He tried to exhale, pinned to his seat with exhaustion. The sky was red, dotted with incoming missile flares. They were strangely beautiful, like fiery flowers. Combine mechs stood watching as well. Some ran their mechs in a useless panic, while the rest just stood there, marvelling at the burning warheads. A soldier approached. No, it was Alex. He made it. Alex limped towards the awesome and saluted, and then put his hand over his heart and pointed to Paul. Another approached. It was Ren. Incredible! Ren saluted and smiled towards the downed mech. Alex sat first, cross-legged on the left, of the awesome. Ren saw him and waved. They laughed. Ren sat, knees up, then crossed his legs like Alex. Paul moved the remaining arm of his mech to point to the sky to show them that he was still alive. They sat there watching the red sky in awe of their fate until everything glowed white and the ground shattered around them. Well, hello everyone, Shrapnel here. Wasn't that a fantastic tale? First up, let me thank James Ripley for requesting it. James dropped a comment, pleasure to deliver. If like James, you've got a recommendation, then drop a comment below. You can follow me on Instagram and DM me, or you can come find me on Reddit. I do more Battletech stuff and behind the scenes stuff on my Insta, if you like that kind of thing. But I really like hearing what you guys enjoy and I actually much prefer recommendations than hunting my own stuff down because I like stepping out of my lane, as they say. And you guys throw lots of curveballs at me and I love it. Secondly, if you do follow me on Instagram, you've seen I've been under the weather recently. Um, I've no fix from the doctors yet, so that means I'll do my best to work around it. But my voice is changing day to day, so makes it hard to record multiple things together. Um, the vocal quality, far from happy with, but I'm doing my best I can. So sorry this episode has taken so long. It's been a lot of stop and start, and a lot of no voice, some voice, normal voice, and lots of ups and downs in betweens. But we got there in the end. That's the important thing. Lastly, if you enjoyed this tale, please support the Shrapnel magazine, which is where this came from. Buy a copy, read it, 
you'll want more. It comes in the medium of your choice, physical or electronic. If you don't know what it is, the Shrapnel magazine is a regularly published anthology, basically, of battle tech short stories. And more importantly, buying the magazine helps support the numerous artists and writers and publishers, and it helps expand the universe that we all love and enjoy. I've got links in the description below. I bought one to read, thanks to James, and now I own all of them. So, thank you, James. Right, now the admin is out of the way. Wasn't that a wicked story? I mean, isn't it great to find a tale from a period immediately after the Exodus, but before everything has been ripped apart by nuclear war and war crimes? I love this story and the writing. I do have one gripe with it though, which is the character of Chick. I mean, supposedly Doc has raised these battalions from scratch over years and years, so surely he must have had an idea that Chick is a douche. I don't know how he got that far up in command to get his own um, lance and everything, but I know, I know, plot devices, etc, etc. Regardless of that, I just love the dynamic kind of group thing that they've got and this hero worship of Doc and he's the real deal, you know? He's holding out against a full-on Draconis Combine attack. He's going to get overwhelmed eventually, but he's formed the rocks that are breaking the waves. It's great. And you can just see it in your mind's eye, just him stomping forward in his awesome, ready to kick some drag butt. And isn't it also great to finally have a full-on, no-holds-barred urban brawl with an, <laughs> with an enemy that is fully committed to overwhelming you with full force and suicide runs, apparently, just to take you out. It's very telling to me that the Federated Sons Command would instead of losing a factory or a city or a continent or the planet and coming back, liberating, defending, they would rather cut to the chase and just glass it and commit a war crime and just nuke the bejesus out of it. <laughs> it's, it's very, very efficient. You can't really argue with it, can you? So. No mech factory for the Combine, it's a very stark sign of times to come, where entire worlds are raised to ashes, pushing the Innisfear back to a dark age, and Nouveau Toulouse does get liberated eventually in 2812, which is 22 years after this event, but by this point the planet is practically dead from the succession of wars, where it gets forced over several times, and just horror, horrific war crimes committed on it time and time again. There's no information on what the Six Factories built, which is a bit of a shame because I would have loved to have known that. I would guess by the way they were nuked, they might have been something special, but it could have just been making blackjacks for all we know. So we'll have to fill in the blanks there. But that is the joy of short stories. It leaves you with just enough information to start forming these little ideas in your head which then spurs you off to go and write your own campaign, write your own fan fiction, do more research, sana.net, love you, or you know, buy the next book, buy the next technical readout. It's great. It just opens up a whole new world. And to be honest, with Battletech, you can just keep on going and going. So, if you liked this story, please give it a like and drop a comment below. I always respond to comments and I love reading them. If you really liked it and haven't already, hit that subscribe button and mash the bell. If you mash the bell, you'll get updates when videos come out. If it's a proper short story, I try to do one a week. It's a little bit slow right now, so it's kind of every few weeks. But there are some longer ones coming up, which obviously do take me longer to do. If you didn't like it, well, there's that other button. Thank you, everyone, for being patient. And I hope you enjoyed Doc Ben's Scorpions. And we'll see if these guys come back in the future, maybe. Who knows? And I hope to see you on the next tale. Till then, stay safe, everyone. This is Shrapnel. Bye.